on August 28th um, of 1854, a very popular well, some of you I know know the story, uh, I won't go into it in too much detail, but a very popular well got contaminated with the bacteria that causes cholera. Um, within the space of about two or three days, the, the, the kind of most densely uh, kind of torrential outbreak of cholera ever to hit London erupted in that neighborhood. Um, within the space of about 10 or 12 days, the neighborhood had literally been decimated. 10% of the population had died, uh, and, and probably 50% would have died if so many people hadn't fled. Um, it was just utter devastation, incredibly, you know, just gripping, tragic scenes of, you know, entire families dying together in their, you know, one-room flats over the space of 24 hours and this kind of agonizing death alone in the dark. Um, just, a, just a horrible, horrible kind of scene. But a very dark moment turns out to have, in a, in a bizarre way, this kind of happy ending because this outbreak ended up being the turning point in solving the, the riddle uh, of where the cholera was coming from. And it produced, ultimately, uh, a very famous map, where I got the, the title for the ghost map. Um, uh, many of you have seen, a bunch of you probably have seen it in uh, Tufti's books, those of you information architects um, out there. Uh, it's become a kind of an icon of great classic early cartography and information design. Um, and it was created by Jon Snow, uh, and Snow was a, just a classic great 19th century mind, lived, crucially lived in the neighborhood, um, just, just kind of down here uh, on the edge of where the outbreak took place. Um, and what's fascinating about Snow is when, when this story is told about cracking the code of cholera and the use of this map and Snow's, Snow's role in it, um, it's often told, in fact, in the, in the first version that, that Tufti told in, in his first book, um, he, he got all, pretty much all the facts exactly wrong. Um, it's pretty amazing. And, and I, as far as I know, it's never been corrected. He, he then kind of retold the story in the next book and, and got the facts right. Um, but you would think he would go back and just mention that he had it wrong. Um, but basically, the, the story is often told as this kind of triumph of information design. Um, that uh, Snow made this map of the outbreak, and the outbreak and the map kind of pointed him to the culprit uh, of this pump. Um, and in part that's true, and in part that's that's fundamentally wrong. And and I want to explain why it's wrong. But just to explain the map for those of you who don't get it, the the map basically is a, is a, is showing deaths at all the various uh, addresses. Um, so these big black bars you see right around the pump in the center. Um, those are places where the longest one is a, is a residence where about 20 people died. Um, so there's a bar for each death. And you can basically see the kind of death radiating out from that pump. It gets thinner the further you get from the pump. And one of the things also that Tufti didn't mention is uh, a later version has this gray line going around, which is actually kind of a map of, uh, of time projected onto space. Um, that, that outline is the map of the area where it was closer to walk to the Broad Street pump. Um, in terms of the actual kind of time walking down these crooked London streets um, than it was to walk to any other pump. So Snow had kind of calculated all the distances and figured out, you know, this is the area where people were likely to use this pump as opposed to these other pumps. And in fact, the diseases, the, the outbreak is really contained almost exactly within the kind of erratic contours of, the, of that line. So it, it is undoubtedly a very, very powerful map. Um, and it, it's, it's a great example of kind of the, the power of visualization. This could have been a statistical table of, you know, distances from the pump, number of deaths. It would have, you know, taken you, you know, three hours to go through the data to make sense of it. Here you, you look at that and you say, okay, there's something wrong with that pump. Um, so it was very powerful. But Snow actually had the idea five years before he made this map. He had come up with the idea that cholera was, in fact, in the water and not in the air. In 1848, 1849, he published extensively about it, actually, had been roundly ignored by the authorities, um, had done a number of studies trying to find a kind of comparable uh, statistical breakdown where he could show the, the likelihood of the, of the cholera being in the water. And a number of them are quite convincing, but somehow they never took hold. And so he was effectively kind of sitting around waiting for something to come along that would help him make his case. Um, and so when he heard that all these people were dying just a few blocks from him, he went straight into the belly of the beast and started knocking on the doors to try and figure out where people were getting their water. So there's this interesting kind of symbiotic relationship that Snow had to the bacteria. They needed the bacteria to kind of destroy a neighborhood in order that he could save it, in a sense. Um, but he also needed help. So he came into it with a theory, and 
he ended up having a, a, a wonderful kind of partner in this investigation who's always been ignored in the telling of this story, who's the, the Reverend Henry Whitehead, who was at the time uh, about 26 years old. This is him at the end of his life. Uh, I have no idea whether he had a beard like that uh, at that early age. Um, and he was just this classic, Whitehead was this classic you know, local vicar who uh, was hanging out in the neighborhood, knew everyone, was just a classic kind of connector. Um, he was, you know, was constantly staying in the pubs until late at night with his parishioners. He was that kind of vicar. And uh, going over for tea and all that kind of stuff. And, and at a certain point in, in the middle of the outbreak, he had heard word that, that Snow and this local doctor had developed this theory that the pump was, was the cause of the outbreak. And he started investigating because he knew firsthand that the pump at Broad Street had the best water in all of Soho. And so he got involved in this case too, tracking down, trying to disprove Snow's theory. And, the, and what he had that Snow didn't have, because Snow was not really kind of a social person at all. He was a brilliant mind, but he was not, he was not the, the kind of personal local vicar-like figure that, that Whitehead was. So Whitehead was able to get into people's houses and talk to them and interview them at length and to track down the people who had fled through his kind of extended social uh, network. And he ended up doing a lot more of the actual kind of uh, street-level detective work than Snow did. Um, and so ultimately, actually, drawing upon also a lot of kind of public information uh, that was being made freely available uh, by William Farr, who was kind of the head statistician, um, Snow, Whitehead put together this overall kind of table and a few other kind of charts, and eventually, over time, convincingly persuaded the authorities that, in fact, the cholera was in the water. It took longer than people think. Um, but by the time cholera came back to London, in 1866, with real severity, the authorities immediately treated it as a problem with the water supply. They had already started building the sewer system to deal with separating out the waste from the, from the drinking water. And they instructed everyone around this new epidemic in 1866 to boil their water. And that was the last time that cholera attacked the city of London. 